say in Our Father to um, get ourselves in a mood here for the, uh, for the talk. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. <clears throat> now, in our day, there is a lack of faith in the Blessed Sacrament, as you all know, and the real presence in the Blessed Sacrament. Um, I think there's a very small percentage, maybe Father would know, who actually believe that Jesus is really present in the Blessed Sacrament, that it's not just a symbol. Um, but this, we kind of think maybe this is uh, just in our time, but it was way back in Francis's time. People were not, Lisa, you need a chair? Um, over there by Karen, over here, there's a chair. Um, in Francis's time, there was lack of belief in the Blessed Sacrament and also um, in just respect for the Blessed Sacrament at the time of St. Francis. And Francis was a very Eucharistic saint. He, um, he has, we've been putting in our newsletter these different passages from St. Francis, uh, Father asked us to do that, of, of his Eucharistic teachings. So I just brought one here today. And we've had, with this one was in the newsletter, but I kind of just want to read a little bit of it to, to show you where he was coming from. So Francis wrote, and those who saw the Lord Jesus according to the humanity, therefore, and did not see and believe according to the spirit and the divinity that he is the true son of God were condemned. Now he's talking about people who saw Jesus in the flesh. Now in the same way, all those who see the sacrament sanctified by the words of the Lord upon the altar at the hands of the priest in the form of bread and wine who, and who do not see and believe according to the spirit and the divinity, that it is truly the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ are condemned. So Francis just made a connection between the actual physical body of Jesus when he was walking around on the earth and the Blessed Sacrament, that if you didn't believe that Jesus is Lord or that the Blessed Sacrament is Jesus the Lord, then you are condemned. Now, um, now we don't know, I mean, we can't, we can't say anybody who doesn't believe that is going to hell because we don't know where they are spiritually um, and with the teachings of this day and so forth um, and the just lack of faith in general, et cetera. But, but what Francis is doing is equating the two, the, the host with the bodily Christ. And now how did Francis play this out in his life? Well, Francis was a very literal person. So, Jesus is present in the Blessed Sacrament. He's there. <clears throat> He's the God. He's greater than a king. I mean, greater than an earthly king. You want to treat him with respect. You want to treat his house with respect. So when Fra Francis would carry a broom around with him, he had his friars taking brooms with them when they preached, so that if they saw a church that was unkept, um, dis it, untidy and so on, they would go in there and they would clean it. They would sweep it, sweep out any leaves or debris that was in there and tidy, you know, dust and tidy it up. Why? Because this was Jesus' home. This was his castle. You want to have it looking nice. Now, Father told you about um, how Francis would venerate any priest uh, because the priest was the only way we had Jesus on this earth physically was through the hands of the priest um, when he consecrated the host into the, you know, to, to the Blessed Sacrament. So Francis um, did venerate priests, whether they were, he didn't, he said, I don't look at the sin in a priest. I just look at what he does, his office. And so this was Francis's um, Eucharistic bent, shall we say. But it even went further than that. Francis knew that the words of the mass, the consecration and so on, those were words that the priest says and they were written down and so forth. So Francis, would go around and if he saw a piece of, uh, well, we call it paper, I mean, it wasn't like a parchment kind of a thing, on, like a piece of parchment with words on it, like laying around like scrap paper, you know, somebody threw something out or got torn or whatever. He'd pick it up and go put it in a reverent place because it might have the words 
a, a word that was in the consecration on it, or it certainly would have letters that were in the consecration. So he treated all written ma material with this reverence because it, there might be some connection there to the actual um, prayer of the Mass. So that's Francis's Eucharistic orientation. Now, St. Clair, she was, very, she was very Eucharistic. We don't have a lot of words of St. Clair um, on the Eucharist. We do have this from her rule. Now, this is going to seem kind of paltry to us, but you have to remember that at those days, people would receive the Blessed Sacrament maybe once a year or maybe like before they were dying or something. They didn't receive it every single day like we do here. Um, we're so used to have, having masses all over the place and so on. It wasn't that way then. So this is what she has for her sisters. Her, this is in her rule. Let them receive communion seven times a year. That was a lot. That is on Christmas, Thursday of Holy Week, Easter, Pentecost, the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin, the Feast of St. Francis, and the Feast of All Saints. The chaplain may celebrate within the enclosure in order to give communion to the sisters who are in good health or to those who are ill. So Claire had a very definite um, devotion to Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament in that she was having her sisters receive on these feast days here, and the chaplain could even come in the enclosure, which was a very sacred place, to do this for the sisters. He didn't have to, they didn't have to go to the grill. He could actually go into the enclosure to give them communion. But Claire's uh, belief in the real presence of Christ went a lot further than that. And we have to think of how, how sure are we that Jesus is there in the Blessed Sacrament. In the life of St. Claire, when she was she was bedfast. She was very, um, she had, St. Clair had fasted so much that she actually lost bone mass in her, in her legs and her arms and so on. So she got weak. She wasn't able to really walk without help. Um, it was like what would happen to somebody if they had severe anorexia today. Of course, she was not anorexic. She was fasting because they thought the, you know, the, the more you fasted, the holier you were, the, clo the more you disciplined your body, the closer you got to the Lord and so forth. But this was the effect it had on Clair. But um, the emperor and the pope were at war. And the emperor had uh, Saracens in his army, the Muslims. They were in his army. And they were trying to capture the papal lands, and they had to march through Assisi to get to Perugia, which was a papal stronghold. And so these, this army of Saracen soldiers are coming into Assisi, and they want to capture Assisi. Now, St. Clair's convent was um, if you've ever been to Assisi, you have Assisi up, like up here, and then you have to go down this big, like this big steep hill to get to San Damiano, which is down here by itself in the valley. I mean, there, you know, there was, a, there was a wall around it, but there's nobody else around it. I mean, it was down here with these women in this convent. So these, they, the women were praying for Assisi to be saved and for them to be saved. And all, well, what happens? These Saracens come come down, they get to this convent, they know that there's women in this convent, they under, and so they're going to go in there. Now, the, they have an enclosure, all right? It's all enclosed, the gates are shut, everything's shut. The women are enclosed in San Damiano. The Saracens use their ladders or whatever they use, grappling hooks, scale the wall, jump in, they're in the enclosure, now they're inside the enclosure. The sisters tell Claire what has happened, and She's, she says, I cannot protect you. Go and get, she tells one sister, go and get the Blessed Sacrament. Go get the Lord. So they have, um, they had these, li these little portable monsters. It's not the, it was probably shaped like a dove or a little church or something like this. It wasn't like we have the monsters like we had today for adoration. Um, it wasn't like that. It was like a little house, so to speak, a little container. So this sister brings this, this little tabernacle with the host in it to Claire. And Claire says, help me, help me. So there was like this door, you had, the only way you could get into that monastery 
you had to like, climb up this ladder to come up to this door that the sisters had. And the door was an old door. It was kind of you know, rickety, and it wasn't the greatest. It had fallen on Claire at one point. The friars had to fix it and everything. So the sisters, she said, take me there, take me, because they knew they were coming up. And she, she started here pounding at this door. The Saracens had come up to this door. The sisters help her with this blessed sacrament to the door, and she's like standing in front, she goes, and she's standing in front of the door, and she's there, Lord, I can't help them. You have to save us. We are your daughters. We are your ch children. You have to save us. We can't save ourselves. You have to do it. So, now, this shows several things about Claire. First of all, she believed in the Blessed Sacrament. Secondly, she was the daughter of a knight. And this was a very, in other words, she was going out now herself with her captain to face the enemy. That's, I mean, this is what a knight does. They don't run away. They don't cower. They go out. So that's what she did. And she's calling on the Lord to save them. For some reason, they're banging at them. They're trying to get in. These men are trying to get in to the convent. We don't know why, but somehow the door, didn't, the door held. The door did not give in. The door did not give way. And they heard this voice behind. They heard somebody talking back there. They could hear voices. And they, they didn't know what was going on. And the, finally, the captain of the Saracens, for some reason, said, oh, forget it. We'll just go into the CC. So they left. They left. And they, just, they went back down the ladder. They scaled the wall again and went out and up to the CC. Then the sisters were praying for a CC to be saved. And the Saracens, I guess they decided, well, it's not worth the bottom of the city. Let's just head out to Perugia. And so, that's, they, so the CC was also saved. But this shows that Claire's real belief and trust in the Lord that she would take him like on the other side of the door with the people that are trying to get in there and saying you have to do this you got to do this because I can't do it so um, that was her faith that was her belief now we might do something like that in a desperate situation like you know we've, we have, sometimes we get in desperate situations like Lord you got to help me I can't do this you know so we can't, this is what kind of a desperate situation um, but St. Anthony had another situation, which is um, kind of put himself on the line, so to speak. Not just with, I mean, in, a, in front of a whole city. Um, at the time of St. Anthony, Father was telling you about the Cathar heresy, that um, they had many weird beliefs. But one of them was that they did not believe in Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. They just figured it was bread and wine, and that was it. You know, they didn't believe in the true presence. Um, and so Anthony was trying to convert this uh, well-known heretic in this city of uh, Rimini, trying to convert him to um, the faith. And so, uh, you know, he would, he would bring forth an argument, and Anthony would bring a counter-argument. It was going back and forth like this. And finally, the, the heretic said, um, he said, well, I don't, he said, these other things, okay, I can maybe believe some of that. But he said, I cannot believe that this is the body and blood of Christ. I can see its flesh. I mean, I can see that it's bread. I can see that it's wine. I know what my flesh is. I know what, you know, what blood is. This is not blood. This is not flesh, and so forth. And so Anthony was, was trying to convince him, uh, and it wasn't working. So um, Anthony prayed. God must have given him an inspiration. So uh, the man had a horse or a mule, you know, a beast of burden, a horse or a mule. And the, the uh, heretic said, well, my, even my mule is smarter than you if you're saying that this is the body and blood of Christ. So Anthony said, well, if your, if your mule, you know, venerated the Lord, did homage to God in the Blessed Sacrament, would you believe? The guy said, oh, yeah, I believe that, for heaven's sakes, of course. So Anthony said, okay, will you starve your horse for three days? This was like right before Easter. He said, don't feed it. For, don't get it, give it any food or water for three days. Don't do that. He said, and then on Holy Thursday, you bring your horse and you bring grain, and I will bring the Blessed Sacrament, and we'll put them before the horse, and we'll see what it does, or the mule, see what it does. Well, the guy said, I know what it's going to do. It's going to eat. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, so I said, okay, well, and if he said, if, he, if it doesn't, you know, if it if it eats the grain and it doesn't recognize the Lord, that it's not God's fault, it's my fault because it's my sin and so forth. So they do this, and the whole town hears about this, of course. So um, Anthony, the, the horse is starving. They take the, the horse and they bring the grain 
And Anthony comes with the Blessed Sacrament in, a, in the monstrance. And so they put the grain here. And Anthony stands over here with the Blessed Sacrament. And the mule, or horse, whatever animal, was one of those animals, comes up. And it, it totally ignores the grain over here and goes and kneels in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Like it kneels down. And so like all these people are thinking there's going to be a big joke on St. Anthony and so forth. And now they're like all dumbfounded. And so um, the, the heretic said, well, he said, I believe and I'll take my whole house with me. We'll all become Catholic. And so this is one of the main miracles that Anthony um, performed in that town. And that miracle, the miracle of Rimini, the, the mule, that's downstairs in the Carlo Acutis exhibit. And so is the miracle of St. Clair. That's also downstairs. You can look for them. They're on one of the panels, one of the things Carlo pulled out to put in this exhibit. So um, now if we get to Carlo, you, Carlo really had such a devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. And you saw that in that film we showed last night of how he would go and visit churches and so forth. I mean, even as a little boy, he just knew that God was in there. And he said, you know, the Eucharist is my highway to heaven. And I'm thinking, oh boy, did you ever get that right, Carl? <laughs> With all these miracle exhibits and everything that he put together and how much they're all over the world and so forth. How many people, I mean, I can't imagine the number of people that have viewed those exhibits or got the books or whatever. Um, so uh, when, when Carlo, uh, one of the miracles that's in there, and I always forget the name of it, but you'll have to look at it. It was a recent miracle, a recent miracle that they um, took the, and similar to Lanciano, uh, they had the, the, ho the host turn to flesh. They, uh, the experts took a piece of this, this host turned to flesh uh, to um, uh, this, this, these forensic experts to test it. And so there was this very well-known scientist that tested this. And um, he said, he, the same result that the, all the other ones that were tested was the same thing. But I mean, he, he didn't know where it was from. He just, they gave him this muscle and they said, could you tell us, you know, what this is or, you know, explain this to us, whatever. They, not, they didn't tell him it was from a, a Eucharistic miracle. They just said, we have this, uh, we want you to test this. And so he tested, he said, well, he said, this is heart muscle. This was type A, whatever blood type it was. I think it's AB, type AB, this heart muscle. Um, he said, this was taken from someone that was under great stress at the time this was taken. And he said, I don't know how you got this sample, but that person was still alive when this was taken. Um, but he said, that's what it is. It was, it's a heart muscle under somebody that was under extreme stress, and they were still alive when it was taken. And then they told him what it was, that it was from this Eucharistic miracle. And you know what the scientist said? I don't believe it. Now, that's, that should give us uh, food for thought, I guess, because, n I mean, this man knew what it was and still would not believe. So we shouldn't feel distressed if we're trying to bring someone to faith and we show them everything, you know, even by our life, like Father said, or just we prove, you know, um, who was it said, if you believe, no proof is necessary. If you don't believe, no proof is possible. Well, that's a, that's a prime example of that. So, uh, but that, that miracle is down there. And now when Carlo died, before he died, his mother asked him to pray. Pray for more Eucharistic miracles. And there were, I think, three that happened after his death. Like one within, I think, a week after he died, there was a Eucharistic miracle. And that's downstairs. I think that was Tixler. And then there, was, uh, there were two others, and I, we have them all. Um, but there have, there's, I think there's others that have been happening more recently that I see on the internet that they're not, I mean, they're not in this exhibit. I don't have to be examined and so forth. But Carlo's at work up there, still building his exhibit. So um, we, we, um, he, he is really a model for us to really believe in the true presence of, of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, um, uh, just from, from what he's done and what he's doing. So now, uh, that's my little quick talk. Does anybody have any questions or anything? Not that I can answer them necessarily. Okay, yes, Rob. Yeah. I was wondering about his dad. Yeah, 
his dad doesn't factor too much into the, um, I mean, there's still, his parents are married, but his mother is the one that really did a lot of talking, you know, about Carlo and um, went through his, uh, his journals and so forth, and the book that I have downstairs is written by his mother. One of the books down there is written by his mother. Um, but I know his dad is, as far as I know, his dad is still alive and they're still together. After, when Carlo was sick, his mother, he, Carlo knew he was dying. Um, he said to his mother, don't, he said, don't cry. He said, you, you, will, you will have other children. He was an only child when he died at the age of 15. He was only, but he said, mom, he said, you'll, you'll have other children. And after he died, she did, she had twins. So she has, she has twins, and I think, they're, I think they're in their teens now or something like this. We don't, I don't hear too much about the twins. So as far as I know, his parents are still alive, but I don't know a lot about his father. Yep, anybody else? Okay, so now we're going to, go ahead, Father. I want to thank you. Uh, oh. <laughs>